evening, folks. Um, welcome to the April 2022 edition of the Local History Guild. Uh, I'm Mike Dyer, I'm the Curator of Maritime History here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. I am your moderator this evening for a grandiose discussion can be described in no other way. Understanding art in New Bedford, heavens above, how are we supposed to do that? Well, there's a lot of different ways we can do it. Um, you can you know, come to the museum and look at art. That doesn't mean you're going to understand it. Um, you can, uh, you can you know, read books uh, about it, and that still doesn't mean you're going to understand it. That just means you'll be better informed. Um, or you can you know, sort of delve into the, into the uh, modern way in which, uh, in which art and artists are being documented uh, in this a uh, real sort of, um, uh, not really an artist colony in any way, um, but more a region that benefited greatly from the riches of its commerce. Um, and wealthy people were able to commission art and they did back in the 19th century. Uh, and there, and there was a lot of wealth here, and there were a lot of fabulous artists. And you can come to the New Bedford Whaling Museum, and you can see them. Um, but tonight we have, uh, we have, you know, uh, uh, Mary Jean Blasdale is here, um, who is an author of uh, of this, you know, classic text, you know, Artists of New Bedford, uh, a biographical dictionary that Mary Jean published in 1990. And if you're going to try to find it yourself, you better have a $500 check in your pocket because that's what it's going for uh, on ABE books. It's a rare book these days and very valuable. Um, we have a, a local uh, a documentary. I call him a documentary historian. He's doing all kinds of fascinating things with art uh, and documentation here in the region. Ron Fortier um, from, uh, from uh, Fairhaven um, and, uh, and, uh, and Michael Lapides as well. Um, we invited Michael Lapides uh, to sort of chime in here at the end of this program because he's going to be taking much of what Ron's working on and creating a museum exhibition out of it so that, so that not only can you experience what Ron's doing uh, in the variety of formats in which he's doing it, uh, but you can come to the museum and uh, experience it here, um, which is a, it's pretty dynamic and interesting, I think, way uh, for the museum to function, um, especially you know, in, in, the, in the really dynamic mediums that we're living in, in the, uh, in the uh, 21st century. But, um, but uh, first, um, uh, first off, we'd like to uh, talk to Mary Jean because you know, she, uh, you know, she sort of in the, you know, in the manner of, you know, these giant traditional sort of tomes of, of biographical, you know, uh, reference, uh, but actually far more elegantly than that, uh, tackled the collection here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum as a kind of a, as a kind of a springboard into, uh, into the much larger stories of the artists of the South Coast. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mary Jean Blasdale. And I think Mary Jean is gonna uh, share her screen with us, but you know, if you share your screen, that's great. If you don't, we'll just keep talking until you do. Uh, and it's up to you, Mary Jean, however you wanna go um, next. Well, maybe I should just introduce you. And I'm so happy that Ron Fortier is here to show the next uh, issue of recording people. Uh, what happened was I was a, became a docent in 1980 and did the regular docent training, et cetera, and went into the curatorial department and I was asked what I really loved and what I said I really loved was art history. So they gave me the job of finding, tracking all the different artists, especially the ones we had in our uh, collections that we knew nothing about. We just had their work. And I said, okay, that, that sounded fun. So for the next 10 years, I tackled uh, the library up at uh, New Bedford Library, which has all the um, directories, the city directories, and pulled out every name that claimed they were artists. And they it, it pretty much had to be somebody that was either born here. I had three 
parameters that I worked with. They had to be born here or had worked here, even if it was only temporarily, because they left, they recorded things in this area. And they secondly had to work in with paper, paints, wood, they could sculpt this sort of thing. But the third thing, the third criteria was they had to have passed away because that way nobody could come back and, and yell at me for what I had written. Uh, I just had to pull it out of the newspapers and the directories and, uh, you know, art folios. There had been a big art, the first art history, um, art, well, first um, exhibit was Albert Bierstadt's in 1858 here. So I could pull a lot, well, he included a lot of European artists in that as well. And before that, the book basically covers from about 1800s to 1945, 50. Uh, I cut it off that way, um, so it wouldn't be too labor intensive. In fact, because of the fact that I was able to work with a computer, that made all the difference in the world because I didn't have to come back and retype everything again and again and again. And so that was a great help. That's where I think Ron's uh, progress and what he is doing is so wonderful because of the new things that we are having to do. So uh, I thought maybe I would just give you eight quick paintings or maybe a couple of paintings of each particular artist, just to give you a variety of what I was working with and how much fun. And at times I went down to the Naval Academy, I went down to New York, went to Smith College, I went to Boston to pull up information on various people. So let me see if I can share the screen here. So while Mary Jean is tackling no. her screen share, you'll <laughs> oh, see dear. this is very much the traditional way that scholarship was done. Um, she had to get in her car and go to the, you know, to the Naval Academy or to the Metropolitan Museum of Art or wherever it was. Um, and, uh, and she had to, you know, enter all the data and, uh, and create this, uh, this work of reference. Okay. Well, at least it seems like I've gotten one up. Does this look okay on your screen? Okay. This is the person that I think is the father of New Bedford art. He is William Allen Wall, who lived from 1801 to 1885. And he did every phase of art except for sculpture and printing. Printing was a little beyond him, but he had oils on paintings. He did personal, um, this is um, a portrait of himself, his own personal portrait. He did portraits. They started out a lot in 1830s and around there to do portraits because they are trying to use this as their income for their family. And uh, they had been, the uh, community were Quakers. They were starting to come away from that particular faith, but they were Quakers and didn't believe in art. And they didn't have art around. There were no museums in the country, no art schools, not even art in classes until after John Dewey um, democratized the education. So they had it around the 1820s, 30s for children. In any case, um, he learned his techniques from his father who had come over from England where he had been taught. Uh, he started out and was doing pretty well. And then he was um, went down to Philadelphia to Thomas Sully, who was the premier portraitist of the time. And he, Thomas Sully encouraged him to go to um, England and do his studying. When he came back from England, he had been studying what we <laughs> considered the Rococo styles. So you see all of a sudden these two little girls that happened to be his daughters, Annie and Mary, they're not just standing up there stiffly, they're dancing around, they're picking the flowers. Their uh, skirts are full and fun. It looks like they're having a great time. 
So he uh, adapted his studies and the next one he did, he also got into narrative painting, which was really um, imaginative because this is a 1602 and nobody happened to have any cameras in those days, nor did they. Some people traveled with people that would sketch, but this was his interpretation of Bartholomew Gosnold meeting the Indians on Smoking Rock in New Bedford. So he's scouting out where, where he might settle, if this is a good area. It's quite across from Palmer's Island on the left. So he, um, he would exhibit these paintings. He had many of them that he produced and he, it would be like going to the movies today. They would go to this uh, Liberty Hall and for 25 cents for adults and 12 and a half cents for children, get to see this wonderful painting that he had done. At this time, there were also itinerant um, painters of portraits. And this one has particularly been of interest to me because it was done by Joseph Whiting Stock, who was between 1815 and 1855. And he was one of the many itinerant painters who came through, but he was different. He had been paralyzed from the waist down at 11 years old when an ox cart fell on him. And he'd lain in bed, he had laid in bed, um, painting his sisters, brothers, family, other members that wanted to, to come in. And, uh, but the doctors felt he needed more help. So they got him a wheelchair that he could sit up in and it was adapted so he could put it on a train. So he, in his diary, mentioned that he was in New Bedford for three visits and he was advertising um, and uh, he did, this is Theodore Stetson Bessie in 1846. He was a two-year-old, very um, good son of parents of moderate means and showing where they lived. So you got to see a piece of furniture and a rug and how he was dressed, still dressing the boys in skirts and dresses, but uh, that gives you a good idea of what it was like for a child. Um, next, of course, was the shipping. The ships being built for the whaling industry, the owners were becoming wealthy, they wanted them shown, broadside with everything, all the flags flying and all the yard arms and everything was to be seen. And William Bradford, even though his parents didn't want to, him to be an artist, came and did started doing this. This is one of his early paintings of the Bark Vigilant around 1852. Um, later on in his life, he had gone down to New York and met a, a fellow by the name of Albert Van Beest. And um, he needed to liven up his space. So he looked at the ocean the way it should mostly look. And some other people working there hard, filling their sea duties. And uh, this is the whale ship Twilight in 1854. The man who led him into this, Albert Van Beest, did this personal portrait on paper. Uh, he was an interesting fellow. He spent his youth on the shore, the docks of the Netherlands. And he just loved the rowdy sailors and the stories that they would tell. And he was just fascinated. And as he um, became, so talented in his artwork, uh, the, the ship, they talked to the Prince Hendrik of the Netherlands and in 1845, he went out to sea with him and he learned you know, more about sailing, but he also loved the terror of shipwrecks and things that would happen at sea. And this particular painting on paper is done with tobacco juice and sepia. It was one of the things that he, he didn't have any money. So I'm sure there was one way of his trying to find another way. And it's called Castaways in 1850. Certainly nothing anybody else would want. Um, so when um, 
Bradford saw all of his wonderful work, he asked uh, him to come back to New Bedford and he would have pay his rent and board. And if he would teach him the things and one of my favorite paintings in the Whaling Museum is this painting of um, shipping New Bedford Harbor that the two of them did together, both Albert Van Beest and Bradford. And um, Albert probably did the skies because he was really excellent at that. And of course, Bradford knew the whale ships. So he was able to do all the whale, whaling voyages and um, know exactly what the ships would look like. So that was a very nice addition. Well, we had another fellow who came over from England called Edward Seeger. And he was here uh, about the same time as William Allen Wall. He um, learned the Rococo movement. You don't see any straight trees in this picture. And uh, he came to New Bedford. He came to New Bedford from England and was teaching around the Boston area and came down to New Bedford. And uh, they, he and William Allen Wall went to Westport. And here you see another painting of Russell's Mills in Westport done in 1856. But he also had a friend of Daniel Webster who encouraged him to apply for a job at the Naval Academy. That's why I went down to the Naval Academy. He was their first professor of drawing and drafting in Annapolis, Maryland. Later, Abraham Lincoln appointed him professor of mathematics at the Naval Academy. So we had many artists that came through here that went on to very great professions. Robert Swain Gifford was a man of the area. He was born on one of the islands, the Elizabeth Islands. He um, came to Fairhaven with his parents when he was little. So he's hung around to be, um, uh, seaside and learned also from Albert Van Beest. Uh, and he was going into more the Barbizon school where they started to tone down the colors. And then you got more of the um, grays and browns, but he kept the wild sea. And this was over um, his, um, the Grand Manan through Canada. And then he also, well, his favorite was to do landscapes in Dartmouth. It's, he ended up moving to Dartmouth. He built, um, he built a large summer home in South Dartmouth and Nonquit. Uh, and he would be there in the summer. And then in the winter, he'd go down to New York. But this is a landscape showing the salt works in Dartmouth. So, He's another one that, uh, and he's another one that brought somebody else to New Bedford. And this is Dwight William Tryon, who lived from 1849 to 1925. Uh, he was a good, became a good friend of uh, uh, Robert Swain Gifford down in New York. Uh, Tryon here had been in a bookstore, working in a bookstore in Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut, where he was really developing his artistic school skills as well. And when he, his friend Mark Twain told him not to pursue painting as there was no money in it. Fortunately, he did not take his advice because he became a premium artist in this country. After studying in France and meeting R. Swain Gifford, he came to Dartmouth, bought a home, in the har that sits in the harbor today and spent the rest of his summers summering here. He also was a Barbizon toneless style. He liked the, the autumn colors. And he also, because of being, um, he had a patron, Charles Lang Freer, who was with, uh, in love with Asian painting. So you get the, the vertical and the horizontal always, the stress between them. He also was an interesting, led an interesting life because he became the first professor, art professor at Smith College in Northampton, Mass. He loved to teach and he collected paintings 
that he would purchase of art, contemporary artists. And this was all to go into an art museum, which he was funding all by himself. And he did do that. He did fund it, but tragically, he, it was not finished until after his death in 1925. And he is buried in the Dartmouth Cemetery, one of the Dartmouth cemeteries. His patron, Charles Freo, who really made uh, a great bit for him, He's um, collected him and Charles Freer was one of the early first, um, you know, mega millionaires that fund, gave their whole collections to a, the, a museum. And he started out giving it all to the Washington, you know, the Insta Smithsonian Institution. But then they spun off his and there's a freer gallery in Washington, D.C., which houses many of, a, of his works. And they were also framed by a famous architect known as Stanford White. So he is also one of our artists and was very famous. So I, it's just interesting that during that, those hundred years, basically, how they all intertwined with each other and fed each other in learning. And uh, it, it was fun. I really enjoyed doing it, even though it took 10 years <laughs> to go through and, and get all 250 collected. And, but thank goodness for the computer, it was so much easier. So that's just what I wanted to show you, just a few of the paintings to give you an idea of the variety and yet how they all got together. So if you want to take it from here, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, there's so, so much to talk about, isn't there? I mean. Yeah, there really is. And I'm sure Ron has too with his the studies he's been doing. I do think it's worth pointing out, you know, that Bierstadt um, and Wall both sort of tackled history painting in addition to mm -hmm. Wall in particular, in addition to his painting live landscapes of the region. Right. And, um, you know, just speaking for myself as a maritime curator, I'm less interested in their history paintings. It just so happens that we have you know, a William, ba uh, a, 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 an Albert Bierstadt history painting, you know, That's the landing right. at, at Cuddy Hunk. Um, I'm, you know, I'm far more interested in, in Albert Bierstadt's views of Yosemite than I am of his ideas of Cuddy Hunk in 16-2. Um, the same with William Allen Wall, you know, that, that warm set of Mills painting that's hanging up in the Energy and Enterprise Gallery is one of the, you know, one of the great treasures of the museum. I mean, it's like his sort of spot on, documentation of and interpretation right. you know it's it's just lovely stuff so that's fabulous and, and what um so if you had to guess ron where 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 do like your top dozen artists fit into this conversation today if you had to guess <laughs> well let's see we have uh mary I jean you might want to lose your screen here okay. i just i we just uh, recorded the 119th artist um and that includes you know musicians as well uh, a majority of them are visual artists painters primarily um there is definitely a thread that runs through them there's obviously the the swain school of of design um is is the mitochondrial dna for a lot of uh, a lot of the um a lot of the artists that we have and then there's also a split off um and i've i've got to get this this straightened out but there's there's a lot of juggling going on we are expanding we've received some grants um but you know what before we go to that I'm, I'm, i want to show you something uh, if i could share my screen um i'm so glad to, to, i've spoken with mary jean on on the phone uh and i told her you know how this all began and she was so gracious and i think at one point you, you know we, we discussed wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get your book somehow into a digital kind of form uh, whether someone's speaking about these particular artists uh, or or um, something, and you said, "Well, you know, I did it from I think 1749 to 1949, 
it would be wonderful if we could pick it up from 1949 and move it on up to the present, which would be a gargantuan task because we really have no idea um, uh, how many artists there actually are in, in New Bedford. So um, I'm going to show you this. <clears throat> this is one of the pages uh, from uh, our website. Um, and this is, this is the genesis. It all started with a newspaper clipping. I don't know what compelled me or impelled me to, uh, to clip it out, uh, but it was Mary Jean uh, asking, um, she was looking for information on 150 individuals, those three columns, and she wanted a name, a birthday, an exhibition date. Um, and it was basically whatever she could she could get uh, to, to move forward with this book. And I saw that and something just clicked in my head and I clipped it out and I kept it. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, I kept it uh, all, all these years. And then I, I bumped into the co-founder of the Artist Index, uh, Jeff Watton, who's also the, the co-founder of Spectrum Marketing Group and also a, uh, an out-of-pocket sp sponsor, um, you know, helped design this wonderful website. Um, the what got me going is that my mother, uh, which was another another uh, part of the story, my mother was a uh, a fadu singer. Uh, she's American born, but uh, the family returned during the depression to Portugal uh, when she came back uh, right after World War uh, II. Um, she began a singing career, singing traditional fadu, and uh, she was also doing American standards because you know you do what you have to do to to uh, continue continue on her uh, your career. And I thought about her and there were some recordings of her. I do have newspaper clippings of her, but what I thought was is that she's uh, going to be 96 uh, in September. What I thought was um, when I pass, she'll die again. I, I, I thought that was a horrible thought. All these people who have contributed to the culture of this area, um, some of them uh, just faded away into history. And um, um, some of them were quite uh, successful during their lifetime. Some of them were never recognized. So the goal was to try to do something about it. The elevator pitch was, well, what is the artist index all about? And I said, well, we're building pyramids and people would give, give me a funny look. And I'd say, look, pyramids weren't built to hold or preserve bodies. They were built to preserve memories because memories is where the soul is, is you know, is what, what the soul is is built with, our memories. So um, with that in mind, that's why we began this project. And um, it's been about 10 years in the making. Um, and the last couple of years since I returned from Portugal, it's been full on. When, uh, when I returned, Jeff said, guess what you're going to be doing? And I said, what's that? And he said, you're going to be doing podcasts. <laughs> yes. said, I'm going to be doing podcasts. I said, you know, there's an old saying that says uh, you have a, a face for radio, uh, but um, I certainly don't have the voice for it. And um, but, you know, dove in and started doing it. And um, the takeaway for me, other than meeting you, uh, Mary Jean, and other than uh, being associated with Michael, the two Michaels, uh, through Christina, uh, Christ Christina uh, Conant Brophy, who led me to uh, Dr. Akea de Barros Gomes, who led me to Michael. Uh, and we're now collaborating and getting all of this stuff, uh, all, all of this data that we're, we're pulling out uh, uh, archived uh, as, as Michael uh, Lapides likes to say in perpetuity. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just the beginning. And um, there are things that I would like to find out my instructor, one of my four instructors at what was SMU at the time. Uh, there was Frank McCoy who passed just a couple of years ago. I think he passed just before the pandemic. Bill Elliott who uh, passed just before him. Um, uh, Herb Cummings uh, who uh, was one of my mentors. Uh, and then uh, Edward Tonieri who was one of the developers of acrylic paint. Um, and he, he's, the, he's the father of a, a, acrylic paint. Uh, he worked for the then Boker company, which is now Golden. Um, somehow, from what I understand, uh, Professor Tonieri was uh, an interim president at the Swain School. Someone lured him away from Swain to U, uh, SMU. He started the art department there, which is now the CVPA. 
Um, but both he and David Loeffler Smith, which is one of the kingpins of the uh, Swain School of Design, uh, were students of Hans Hoffmann. So we start creating this genealogy and what you did, what you presented this evening, uh, Mary Jean, was absolutely perfect. It's, it's amazing how people, by their acquaintances, by their interactions, um, this is what it's all about. And if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't have all of this information from 1749 approximately to 1949. And I think it's really, really important that we pick that up because in there, there's Mal Oliveira, one my first and my only private uh, painting teacher that I had before I, um, I uh, went into college. Um, uh, Francisco Raposa, uh, who was my high school art teacher and who led me to another step. And I think that's all very, very important. Um, and we have the Rebello exhibit right now at the Whaling Museum. Uh, and that is a whole nother category of the Luso-American artists um, in this area. There's so much to be done. Uh, it's more than a lifetime's worth of work. And um, so our goal is to try to um, attract as many uh, visual and performing and literary artists as we can to do a podcast. Uh, we have several new things that are starting. One of them is a, um, a self-created video. You go onto our website, you click on a button, you have three minutes to, to tell your story, uh, fill out a little form so that we have that in our database. Uh, there's the, the podcasts. Uh, I've been trying to get Don Wilkinson uh, to write for us uh, because he just celebrated his 10th year with the Standard Times doing art reviews. And that's another area I'd like to get into is to archive all of the, the uh, exhibit information because th that exhibit information gives us um, um, uh, primary documentation of artists that may have fallen through the cracks, so to speak. The only place that we have that they're documented in is in an exhibit. So for a young art history uh, PhD, this, this is, a, uh, or, or several young uh, PhD candidates in art history, this is, this is a perfect project to, uh, to get involved with. Hey, Ron, does, does Gallery X, do, do the galleries around here publish little uh, programs or little brochures or, or, or materials that can be archived? Posters, postcards, yes. In, in fact, Chuck Hawk or Charles Hawk, who was one of the co-founders or uh, there, there was a, it was almost like the 12 disciples of the of Gallery X. Um, when uh, from the very beginning, he, he, has, he has squirreled away uh, all of that documentation. That is all valuable information. It's as valuable as my mother's um, um, uh, appearances um, in the area. I mean, she, she sang from Chicopee uh, all the way down to uh, uh, Elizabeth in, in Newark, New Jersey. And she sang on the same, the same uh, stage as uh, Amalia Rodriguez, but it's really interesting to see a piece of a document. This is documentation right here, uh, something right out of a newspaper. So yeah, that, that is a very, very valuable uh, piece of, uh, of uh, information is to get all of that, the, the, the um, 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 oh my God, um, it's paraphernalia, it's, um, I'm just blanking out on the word. <laughs> um, but it's all valuable. And we have artists who lived in town um, who went on to incredible careers. And some of them um, are, are remembered. Ken Davies, for example, was, was a very well known in his lifetime. He had his studio right behind the Whaling Museum. And there are countless others, I'm sure that uh, that we've uh, we've forgotten about um one of the things for example is uh, my instructor is um, primarily uh, herb cummings and uh, and ed tonieri who uh, did quite well in their lifetime but now try to find one of their pieces of work unless it's with the family so, so what do you do about these sort of ephemeral kinds of artworks murals uh, and whatnot that they, they may last on the sides of buildings they may not uh, but they're certainly representative of public art and they're absolutely representative of, of, you know, art, you know, sort of in the, uh, in the area. Um, is that, uh, how do you tackle that? I think you really uh, need to, to write a grant to get a photographer who is, is uh, well-versed in, in photographing flat, spa uh, flat space. Um, 
and because it is ephemeral i mean it's just like uh advertising um what the, you know you see ghost signs to this day in new bedford um whenever it rains um it it's just i believe just as valuable as anything else uh and part of the tradition of graffiti a street art is is that one artist comes along and covers over that piece of art and starts all over again um you know the 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 origins of it it's uh, it's almost like um an iconoclasm of sorts where uh, a lot of this art was associated with gang activity. So it was a way of marking territory by, by coming in and painting over um, another gang's uh, uh, iconography. You know, look at it, it seems to me like, you know, in comparison to what Mary Jean was talking about in the way I opened the program where we're talking about patrons of the art uh, in the 19th century, you know, people who could uh, who could afford to uh, buy, you know, a ship portrait of their ship because they're multimillionaires, uh, or however else these paintings came to be made and, and to be preserved. You're just talking about, you know, gang graffiti. I mean, you know, uh, in addition to the great, you know, in, in uh, uh, you know, in, you know, Milton Brightman, for instance, you know, whom we collect and. And uh, and uh, who's the other one? Loeffler Smith. Uh, David you Loeffler mentioned, Smith, you yeah. know, these are the you know these are these are sort of traditional artists in in a traditional format, but that's that's not anywhere near what the world, the nineteenth century world that Mary Jean was documenting. The entire world is different now, uh, you know, in, in in an urban twenty first century sort of urban landscape where these kind of large scale murals are painted on buildings, you know, it doesn't say vinegar bitters, you know, it's, you know, it's, like, it's and bigger than that. They've been sanctioned. I mean, there was a time where that was an act of vandalism and that was part of the culture. Um, uh, Taki, if you, um, another artist from this area uh, was uh, uh, Rene Ricard, who wrote the seminal article on Jean-Michel Basquiat. He, he lived in uh, Kushner, and he went to New Bedford High because you know they didn't have a high school, uh, but he's the one that brought brought Jean Michel Basquiat to the forefront with that article in Art Forum magazine, um, and he goes through this entire um, um, litany of all of the street people that started these things. But one of the problems with with that kind of urban or street art or graffiti, there's so many names for it, and there's so many levels and layers to it, is that it's like a wild bird, you, you know, the caged bird, you bring this, this wild bird and put it into a cage and you somehow alter its character. Uh, oh, right. We look at scrim shanding, which was considered, you know, uh, something to do or else you go stock raving mad with the doldrums. Um, and it was, you know, there's no screens to play on and they, they were just entertaining themselves. And now people, a drop jaw when they see the the artisanry of these whalers, these crewmen. So it's all valuable. It's all valid, I believe. And it's a big undertaking. I tell people that when Jeff and I started it, we thought, oh yeah, this is you know this will be easy. But now my analogy is, you look at a clock, and what do you see? You see numbers. You see an hour hand, a minute hand, a sweep hand, and uh, it looks pretty simple. But now open up the back and see how complicated it is. <laughs> There's a lot of gears and, and, and spinning wheels and all kinds of other things back there. Um, and New Bedford has this, as Jer uh, 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 Mary Jean well knows, has this incredible, this, there was something about New Bedford that made it an epicenter of many, many things. It wasn't just the industry. There was a there's a vibrancy here, existentialism, abolition. It was like second, what second only to Philadelphia as an abolitionist center. Um, there's so many, and there was a vibrancy here that unfortunately was they went dormant for a few years, for a few decades, and now I think we're in a renaissance that nobody's actually pegged that as a renaissance, but. Well, it's a challenge. I mean, you know, Mary Jean, Michael, you know, we we had these conversations in the collections committee, you know, 10, 15 years ago saying, you know, how are we going to collect for the 21st century? You know, what what is art? You know, what is what's worth preserving? How are we going to know? Um, and what Ron's doing, it seems to me, 
Uh, Ron, could you describe sort of exactly what it is that you're doing? Um, I mean, you know, I mean, you showed us the website and you've mentioned podcasts, but, you know, just just for people, maybe they know what a podcast is, maybe they're not entirely familiar. What is, sure. what is it exactly that you're doing? Well, uh, the a podcasts are the main driver. At one point, at one point, we wanted to um, uh, we wanted to um, do articles, but again, it's it's you know Jeff is doing a lot of the background work. I'm doing the the, the I was doing the majority of the writing uh, and the podcasting. And now what's happened is that um, I finally hit my groove, so to speak, in grant writing, uh, and. Uh, you know, things evolve in ways that you don't imagine. There's, there are other powers, other forces around you. Um, and I put out a post on Facebook for music hosts, because that's another area that I want to go into. I'm especially crazy about jazz and the Cape Verdean community's contributions to the modern jazz standard. So I put out this post and I got three responses. Um, none of them were, was the jazz person I was hoping that was going to pop up, but I have an indie person, I have a folk person, and I have a punk rock and rock person, uh, three genres right there. And I thought, gee, I'm going to split up this grant between the three of them. I'm going to end up getting 21 podcasts I don't have to do, which I wish I could, but I can't because the pleasure, I just spoke with this young man last night, William Kennedy. I was just flabbergasted. I, I was just flabbergasted by this young man. I learned so much from him and, and he's, you know, he's half of my age. Exactly. Um, but um, I realized when these three gentlemen came, came up uh, to that, they were interested in a position that, you know, this has been categorized this, this website as a, a collaborative community digital archive. Mm -hmm. And the word collaborative was these three guys rang the bell of collaborative because now I can hire people grant, you know, through uh, grant supported uh, positions, uh, contracts to do this, and we can keep expanding this. Um, I want to uh, get a host specifically for photography. We have some um, major people, Anthony Barboza, who, who is credited with the iconic, the iconic photograph of Cher. Uh, and there are so many others. I mean, you know, all these names are running through my head and I, I can't stop them. And like a train going by the station. Um, there is a lot here uh, that uh, that we can do. And let me, and let me show you the In Focus podcast. Uh, okay. Okay, here's running. Here we go. So this is, um, this is just... You know, scrolling through just a sampling of all the artists that we've done today. And um, we have uh, visual performing and literary artists. Um, one of the biggest fears that I had was not getting to people. And just a really quick story. My wife and I were at a party a couple of years ago. Uh, we were talking to Don Elizabeth Wilkinson. Uh, we saw Nicole and uh, Mark St. Pierre uh, uh, in the other room. Uh, my wife had never met them. I was, we were going to cross the room to introduce uh, her to them. Um, our daughter uh, had hurt herself. Uh, you know, these kids were running around with 80 pound backpacks in high school. And uh, we had to bring her to urgent care. Mark St. Pierre passed away the following morning. Um, I interviewed a, a friend that I made on the hurricane dike who was always photographing the fishing boats going in and out, Dan Logan. Uh, we were shut down during the pandemic. I went out for the first walk uh, when they let, let up on the restrictions, looking for Dan and found out from another, uh, another photographer friend of his, I believe David Kennedy, that, uh, that uh, Dan Logan had passed away. Um, I did a, a podcast with, um, with uh, Don uh, Hoagland uh, and we were planning on getting together to do another podcast because of a mutual friend of ours tragic, tragic story, uh, Vietnam veterans, uh, Special Forces, Green Beret. Uh, and it's difficult to talk about this, this guy. And we wanted to get together over a few beers with some coffee and Don passed away. And this is just driving me forward more and more because once they're gone, they're gone. But I am so lucky to have been able to get Don and here's Dan right here. 
Dan, uh, um, um, and uh, Don is, uh, I think I probably just scrolled by him at some point. But anyway, um, it this this is really what it's all about. These these this is a memorial. This is this is as long as we speak their name, they 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 stay with us. Uh, there's an African proverb of when an old man dies, the library burns down, and that's that's what I want to do. But do you envision this as maybe as a book someday? Um, you know, with uh, you know two less than a thousand words per biography yes similar, you know a hard copy thing for yes uh even thinking of a biennial uh uh you know a, a publication uh because you know it'll give you those two years to to scramble up the information um i always use the crass joke that you know we're trying we're trying to document the living and the dead and, and um people like well how do you document dead people it's like well you you get you get the people that um knew them uh, whether they're acquaintances or relatives and uh and you sit down with them and and you try to get as much information out, out of them as possible and in some cases what the the emotional aspect of it is is if uh, one of your uh relatives uh was a, a an artist you want to document them uh, because there's no other place to archive this information whether it's ephemera there's the word <laughs> whether it's ephemera right. uh, uh whether it's you know images of 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 their work uh this is a good place to do it in well it sure is and now you know the next step you know for us is um is really challenging because uh how do you how do you capture this stuff in a museum without, you know, going out and beating the bushes and getting examples of artwork from all these folks coming in and hanging them on the wall? And then you've got the art, but you don't have the artist necessarily. So I think that's where Michael, Michael Lapides comes in, uh, you know, as a museum curator and, and uh, uh, a sort of guru when it comes to, to the handling of, of new media. Uh, so what's what do you think, Michael? What what what's the next step for uh, in this process? Wow, Guru, I love that. That's quite the introduction. <laughs> I was going to say. I was thinking to myself, what a perfect segue to Michael. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well. First, I, I want to start just saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, the I want to I want to introduce the the Common Ground Project, and that that's how I. Uh, Ron and I got talking, it was a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, the, the fact is that um, when, when you, when Ron, you mentioned um, in perpetuity and the legacy of this is, and this is the, what the museum can bring to a project like Ron's where we are cataloging and ingesting or, or taking into the collection, accessioning, uh, you know, the, the work that Ron's doing. Um, and and it as part of the common ground project. So the common the common the common ground project, which will actually have an associated an exhibit that opens up in in June. Uh, Henry Hornstein was a local photographer, um, and then we'll follow up uh, in I think it's 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 January of twenty three with the main exhibit uh, at the museum. We'll be it's a it's a storytelling. It's an oral history project, and we ask people to share their stories and record them. Um, it's um, um, it's very exciting. Um, the the chief curator Naomi Slip is now uh, curating that exhibit, and I'm I'm helping her with that. and And we'll be telling stories of uh, there will be some stories about about artists and art for sure, uh, but the Common Ground Project covers whatever whatever stories people want to tell. And so we're, we're, um, we're and, and I can, I can, I'm not going to point you to, bring you to the webpage, but I can tell you if you go under the, the, uh, uh, the Whalen Museum website and go to uh, upcoming exhibits, you can read about the uh, Common Ground exhibit and contribute to the story. We have a, a place on the site, that, uh, on that page that you can click to and, and tell a story there, or you can make an appointment, come in and we'll, we'll record you. Um, so, yeah, the um, collecting stories, it's what we do and it's, and we're changing how we do it, I guess. Um, you know, and Mary Jean, you started off telling us um, the traditional way of, of um, 
telling these stories and printing out a book. And Ron, you've built a website and, you know, there, there they'll meet, you know, <laughs> one mm -hmm. picks up from the other, right? And this idea that, um, you know, when, when, people, when, when people pass, their stories are, are lost and, 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 and we're all trying to save stories, important stories that tell us about who we are and who we were. Um, so uh, it's exciting to have this kind of partnership uh, with, um, with, with uh, the Artist Index, with Ron, and, and encourage everybody to uh, check that out and check Common Ground out. Uh, what was your question, Mike? Did I answer it? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think you know you, the function of the museum in the community is is really, really is a really interesting and dynamic thing. Um, from you know the quiet contemplation of antique you know landscapes uh, to you know the world's largest ship model and all the stories that go on with that. But, you know, as we, you know, what, the way I often look at it is, I know from my chair here, what it is that I need. When somebody, the next guy or gal or person sitting in my chair 50 years from now, what are they gonna need? Who are they going to want to know about? What are they going to need, you know, uh, to to function? You know, um, you know, we have we have this, you know, fabulous um, local artist who, um, you know, we, we had her paintings. Uh, uh, Kate Verdian, artist. Um, hey, go ahead, Ron. Uh, are you speaking about Alison Wells? Allison Wells. Allison she's Wells, she's uh, tr uh, from Trinidad. From Trinidad. Allison yeah. Wells painted uh, uh, that Black Whales, uh, Black Lives Matter um, event up on the corner of County and Union Street. She painted that. Now, to me, that's William Allen Wells' warm set of milk. You know, mm -hmm. 50 years from mm -hmm. now, that painting is going to matter. We don't happen to have that painting. We didn't acquire that painting. I want that painting very, very much um, for the permanent collection. Uh, because that's an event. You can't get past it. It's not just art. It's documentary art. And so, uh, you know, I think that, you know, I think, Ron, as I, as I think more about, you know, the, the sort of that list of people you have there, it's pretty extraordinary, uh, the interpretation that, that, we're, that hopefully the museum is going to be able to bring in, in the next 50 years, you know, especially with the sort of template that Michael Lapides is putting up there about how how to record an oral history, how to exhibit it. Because, you know, a, a museum is all about exhibiting stuff. And what if the stuff is a story? How do you exhibit a story and make it compelling? Uh, that's, that's a challenge and thank God it ain't mine. <laughs> that's your challenge. <laughs> but it's something to think about. And I think we're about at the end of our program. Do you folks wanna have any final statements or anything you want to say before we wrap up for the evening? I just thank you. Thank you, uh, Mary Jean, Ron, and, and Mike for hosting this. This has it's been great. Um, enjoyed it. I just want to say thank you as well to uh, honoring me this way because it's been a while since I published this book. And it's just nice to be recognized before I am dead, like Ron Pond of Fortier <laughs> was saying. Well, <laughs> The other thing, too, is that look what you did. You did what you thought you were doing, but it really affected me, which now is a it's you. you it was a, a, a pebble dropped into a pond oh, and the ripples right. and the ripples you know, have increased. And one of the things I'm looking for is anyone out there who has information on a relative who was a visual performing or literary artist. Uh, please. We have a form that's on the website. You can see it there. Fill it out. We'll get to you to podcast. We want images. We want, we want whatever it is that you have. Uh, and then we want you to speak about this relative, this acquaintance, um, whatever, because don't let them die again. I know it sounds overly dramatic, but please don't let them die again. Well so, said. 
Yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Mike. I'll just I'll just I'll just add that that one final plug too, which is it, to engage with the common ground storytelling right on our website. Penny Penny Cole in the audience feels that this is all pretty compelling that these untold stories will be saved, and we we agree with you, Penny, one hundred percent. So now comes the awkward part of the program, you know, where we have to say good night. We have to say thank you very much to Jocelyn. I have to say thank you to Jocelyn in particular because I uh, I kept losing my Zoom link. And it's like I, I had to, you know, like email her a dozen times to get my Zoom link. So thank you, Jocelyn, for your for your fabulous um, technical prowess and and Carissa, her new assistant. Um, uh, thank you for uh, for coming and, and joining us this evening. Um, so. Uh, you know, now again, you know, I guess we'll have to come to the to the sort of awkward part of the evening where you have to click leave, and then it, and then on Zoom, you know, it's it's done. You know, it's just like it's it's like you're there one minute and gone the next. But I, oh, uh, next month, um, I'm working on. Um, uh, there's a fellow who's written a biography of Benjamin Clough, who was the first mate on the ship Sharon of Fairhaven, uh, where there was a hideous mutiny that took place. Uh, on the Sharon of Fairhaven in 1845, I think it was. Benjamin Russell painted it in the panorama. Um, Bill Purrington, a curator here, wrote about it. Uh, but this fella is, uh, he's very close to the Clough family in Martha's Vineyard, and he has access to all kinds of interesting primary material. So uh, I think I'm going to get this gentleman, uh, Paul Maggot, his name is, um, uh, to maybe we can, we can have a nice Zoom and chat about uh, hideous mutinies in the Pacific and bona fide whaleman heroes. So that's something to look forward to for May, folks. Thanks again. You're welcome. Good night. Good night. Thank Good night. you all. Good night. Good night. Thank you.